Hello, welcome to smarthelping.com. This is the overview video for the Enterprise SAS 5-year financial model. In this, I've just upgraded it extremely uh, with, with some uh, really nice reports. So we've added automated income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement, monthly and annual. I've also added dynamic uh, capex with depreciation if needed, as well as a cap table. Everything else is the same uh, as the model was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the input tabs, explain how it works. And uh, if you want to purchase a template, the link is in the description box below. It's part of the SAS Financial uh, Smart Helping Template Bundle. Um, so we start here on the global control. This is where we're going to define main assumptions about the timing, um, exit, funding source. Um, so start here, company name. This will flow over to the income statement balance sheet cash flow statement right at the top. We've got the launch here. This will define what drop down selections you can make up to five years uh, worth of months. So whatever year you start here, that will change all the drop downs uh, when you select them. Then you have the end month. This is where you pick when the model should end. You could pick any month. Uh, it could be a you know up to five years. So full five years, uh, which would be 60 months or four years, three years or whatever, or even just one year, whatever you want to do. Then you could decide if you want to include the terminal value or not on the end month. So whatever end month you select, if you also select the yes here, you can define the multiple and it will take the trailing 12 month revenue and multiply it by this multiple to get an exit value. If you hit no here, it will zero out and it won't show on any of the financial statements. This is dynamic. You've also got cash sources here. You could fund with that. Um, any remaining would come from equity. This The model solves for minimum equity required to have a positive uh, cash position or a non-negative one. This is the minimum equity needed to do that based on startup costs and any burn, which will change as you change all the assumptions for revenues and costs. This number will flow to the cap table, and that's where the investor and owner equity can be entered. So whatever funds are needed to start up flows here to the cap table. And the minimum equity will populate here. You can populate number of shares if you have a uh, common and then any preferred up to uh, two different types. You could determine the investments by any outside investors here and then the investments by any owners here, as well as their resulting share of a common stock, preferred class A, preferred class B, and their fully diluted ownership value would populate here. There's also a contribution distribution summary for each individual row which is again, dynamic based on all the assumptions. And you could zero out, zero out anything that's not relevant. You'll see checks down here. These should always be all zeros. If we go back here, there are taxes included. If you wanna see the effects of taxes on the net income or taxable income, if not, you can always zero these out. And then finally, you can choose if this is an enterprise SaaS model, so that means contracts that are recurring, and you could choose to collect the cash up front of those contracts by hitting yes here, or you can hit no to not do that. And that will drive any under income on the balance sheet. That will also change cash flow. Obviously, if you collect cash up front, you have more cash flow. You'll probably need less money. So here it's 1.299. If we do collect, if we don't collect up front, it goes up to 2.1 million as a minimum equity needed. Okay, let's go to the revenue assumption. So this is the main guts of the model. Very, very good logic. Uh, this can be used for any SaaS business. It doesn't have to be enterprise. Uh, it could be month to month, or it could be um, contracts that are six month, 12, 18, any, any uh, length. So each, there's up to three customer tiers. And on each one, you could define the month that they begin, the average contract length, and the starting organic customer count. Then you could determine the percentage increase in customers added per month, as well as how that can change over time up to five years. You also can define users added through ad spend and based on your cost of customer acquisition. This will then define the customers added per month in each year based on ad spend. You can also define um, well, that's it. So, so that's it for, for customer acquisition. You have organic and you have ad spend. And then you could define things about the contracts of each customer tier. 
So this you define the average contract value, so $350,000 every six months. You can define how that can increase over time. This is the monthly value of the contract. And then you can also define at renewal. So every six months, you'll have a renewal period for each monthly cohort that joined. You can define the percentage increase in the value of contracts that do renew, if applicable. And this would be something where you can see you know, what that needs to be to have negative churn, which is a good thing. Um, meaning the money you get from current customers is greater than the money lost from customers that leave. And then finally, to figure out who, how many customers do exist over time, you can do uh, the retention right here, which is saying at each contract renewal, how much of the um, cohort remains. So if 100 people sign up in month one, on month seven during the renewal, this is saying 80% are left. And it will do a straight line retention curve, meaning you know if you put 80% here, it means it's gonna take five renewals for that total value to go to zero. Now you can adjust this manually if you think, let's say you sign up 100 customers and on, on the first renewal, maybe 50% remain and then on the second renewal, maybe 40% remain and then maybe 10% or some dynamic number remain after each renewal period. That can be defined on the validation tab here where we're defining the remaining amounts. So you can change that and this is, um, each year can be different, meaning customers that join in year one will, ha will follow this schedule always. Customers that join in year two will follow this schedule, etc. And then these for each tier can be modified for each year. So these don't have to be a straight line. They can be whatever you, whatever data you have to drive retention. And that will, that will apply to um, each customer cohort each month and will drive what the actual churn result is based on these retention rates. Okay, this is some of the coolest logic I've ever done. I really, this is very valuable and it can be used in basically, like I said, any SaaS business and you can underlie it. You can, you can build on top of it and that's the key is that it has the, it has all the base logic needed. It's very clean. Okay. So next we have uh, CS, which is customer service reps. And what that means is for every, um, you, you can define that for each tier, how many customer service reps you need to handle a given customer. And that's defined here. And then what their fully loaded salaries are. And then what their, um, and you can define up to two types, which mainly are differentiated in, the amount you need per customers that exist as well as their salaries. And then you can adjust that over time. And all three work, this, the logic works the same, but um, tier two only applies to tier two customers and then tier three to, to tier three customers. You can also do sales. So same idea here, but now it's sales reps. So this is gonna say, you know, how many sales reps you need based on customers added um, in a given month. And then you could define two sales people type salesperson's types, their fully loaded annual salary, and the ratio and how that can change over time. And same thing, uh, you have different assumptions that can be applied to each tier if you need it. If they're all the same, then you could define the same uh, data for every tier. And you don't have to use all three tiers, you could use just one tier or two. Uh, now we have other costs in here, we're gonna have just fixed expenses. You could define the month each expense starts as well as the fully loaded monthly amount and that can be adjusted in each year. You also have uh, costs as a direct percentage of revenue. This is kind of a catch-all. You could define the monthly start as well as what the percentages are. You also have cost of goods sold as a, um, a metric of total customers at the end of each month for each tier and what your cost is. So this would be like infrastructure costs, server costs, any cost directly related to um, providing the service to customers. Um, and you can define the, the, the fixed amount per month and that changes each year. That schedule, uh, that schedule, here, uh, the finest amount comes from the global assumptions. You can define the loan terms, start date of that, and it will flow through. Note on the end month, if you have included terminal value, then it will assume that you're paying back the loan on the end month. If you were to hit no here, 
and you see we go back to the test schedule now you can this just runs out into this full term and this will flow to the financial statements accordingly capex this is for any uh well the first row is always for buildings so if you're purchasing a building and you're going to use it for offices you could define that here in the month it happens as well as the value at sale everything else is going to be for like equipment infrastructure servers anything that's depreciable and you can define the total cost basis and useful life of that as well as the month of expenditure and the resulting cash flow and uh, net income will be um, updated based on that cap table we already went over startup costs these are just other costs um, that you might have had before operations are planned to begin these are non depreciable items keep in mind terminal value uh, just going to be the exit proceeds split up and you can define how much of it gets um, attributed to extraordinary income versus fixed assets so you can see how those 223 million is spread between extraordinary income and fixed assets based on this ratio it's just going to be a tax thing if you don't have a taxes uh, a tax um, effect that you don't you know if you zero out the taxes you could just put 100 percent for this um, and then the building proceeds also pop in here note if you do hit no on this to not include terminal value that whole table will um, zero out as you can see here finally we have income statement so this is going to show you your total subscription revenues and this is collected this is if you collect cash up front this will not change this is showing the actual earned amount each month based on the contract terms cost of goods sold gross profit your operating expenses this is just um, basically general administrative sales marketing research development and startup costs total opex EBITDA interest uh, depreciation and then we've got um, some tax items here taxable income taxes and net income and these two rows are only relevant in the end in the exit month whatever that is and if you select yes on here again if you hit no those would zero out as you can see you've also got income statement annual which is the same as the monthly but it is on an annual basis we have balance sheet and here you can see we added unearned revenue as an item. So this is if if uh, cash is collected up front, you can see what your unearned revenue is versus earned, which earned would be, so this is unearned, earned would be what hits in the month. So 175,000 earned, so 875 that it's gotta be provided for, uh, future services in the future. And then this will change based on all the different assumptions for how many customers are added and what the contract terms are and everything else but basically you can see at the end here 24 million that's saying if you were to exit the business you have collected 20 almost 25 million in revenue but those services have to still be um, provided so you'd probably transfer that money to the seller or there'd be some consideration for that um, other items are pretty simple here cash your non-current assets accumulated depreciation uh, long-term debt if there's any uh, stock investment retained earnings and then obviously the assets will always equal owner's equity uh, plus liabilities so that will check out there and there's your check and all this is all tied together between the income statement and cash flow statement uh, balance sheet annual is the same thing as a monthly just annual basis cash flow monthly is showing you operating activities investing activities and financing and here you can see where the the reduce reducing amortized revenue and increasing uh, increasing cash collected up front so we get an actual cash position amount uh, and then you've got investing activities financing activities and total cash per period and this flowed over to the balance sheet cash row and again that all has to match up with everything else that's happening and it does we've got cash flow annual an executive summary is just kind of a high level look at all the different main uh, financial line items visualizations distributions is showing the discounted cash flow analysis of the top section which is the project as well as the investor and owner sections uh, you see that present value based on discount rate and the cash flows that are um, attributed to each as well as a visualization here 
more visuals. So key financial uh, forecast. These could go on like a pitch deck, yearly cash flow, cumulative cash flow, uh, month end customers, all month end customers by tier, month ending customers by tier percentage of total, monthly revenue by tier. Then you've got customer acquisition costs, average monthly value per account, average months to pay back your customer acquisition cost. Very important metric here. This is measured in months. Average monthly churn. Again, here we're seeing some uh, churn drop, but if you had a negative churn, that means your revenues are going up from existing customers at a higher rate than what you're losing from customers that leave, which is ideal if you can get that. Um, the average monthly churn, the dollar amount, average life of a customer, average lifetime value, and lifetime value to customer acquisition cost ratio, another very important metric. Uh, then we have the monthly and annual detail. This is where, where all the guts actually happen. So you can see um, tier one, tier two, and tier three customer counts, all customers, the revenue from from that. You've also got churn in dollars that happen as well as churn in percentage, all revenue, um, cost of goods sold, OPEX, EBITDA, other items. So this is kind of a where everything is sourced from. All the different uh, metrics needed to do those visualizations. And keep in mind, and then annual details the same as the monthly, just on an annual basis, obviously. Uh, and then keep in mind all of the logic. The really advanced stuff is happening in the matrix tab, one, two, three, and the validation tab. This is how everything can be dynamic, and this is the real value of the model. So, you know, if you want to purchase it, you can look through it. Everything's easily editable, editable, followable, um, very usable. You can um, play with all the assumptions. Everything is very clear on how it works. You just follow the logic. Nothing's hidden. Um, all the formulas are very simple. Some ifs, uh, some lookups, but nothing real crazy, no offset stuff. Uh, just very simple stuff that anyone could follow. It's just designed in a really nice way. Um, very easy to build on top of as well to make additions. Uh, finally, you can see this check summary here will show if there's any uh, variances, and these should always be all zeros across the board. All right, that's all I got for you. This is the Enterprise SaaS model. Check it out at smarthelping.com, and I'll see you guys on the next one.